Jason Mitchell. O'Shea Jackson Jr. Jason will be playing Easy E. O'Shea's playing his dad. Corey Rockets, come on up, sir. Then we play Dr. Dre. Corey Rockets, give it up. Also, director, the coolest man, the, arguably the coolest man I've ever met in Hollywood. Give it up for F. Gary Gray right now. And of course, um, the voice, the voice of face. Jackson City, damn. Yeah, you, you caught that? Yeah, man. <laughs> Usually nobody said that unless they got a check for me. Yeah, nah, I don't have that. I don't have that. Sorry. Um, so we got a lot of ground to cover while we're here. We're going to be doing a Q&A. I actually got rolled in 87. I was uh, 18. I'm 10 years old when I wrote that. And, um, you know, obviously uh, you were going through something that was, was painful. Was rap your only vehicle, was that what you were feeling at the time? Is that why you chose to rap? And those were some of the, the first things that you wanted to get off when you guys knew it was time? Like, talk talk about the decision to write those records. What it is, we was just, uh, you know, before we was dealing with the police, we was happy <clears throat> that we was doing something positive. We was doing something creative. You know, hip hop was new. Everybody didn't do it on every corner. So we was, doing something outside the box when it comes to our neighborhood. And, you know, on the way to the studio, on the way back, in between, you know, we hearing all these horror stories from each member, you know. Every, it seemed like every week it was something different. Uh, some kind of encounter with the police. In 88, back in the 80s, not just 88, but back in the 80s, Daryl Gates, who was the chief of police in Los Angeles, he declared a war on gangs. Now, you know, to people who are law-abiding citizens, a war on gangs doesn't seem too bad. But when law enforcement thinks every black kid or every black youngster that looks a certain way, you know, uh, is a gangbanger, then it's actually a war on black young youth. Um, and that's what we felt. We felt they pressure. Uh, they didn't have any problems with applying pressure to us. So. You know, we was talking about each other on the records. We was talking about the dope man, we was talking about the gangsters, we was talking about the bitches and the hoes, but we didn't talk about the real problem. So we decided to do a record that addressed the real problem. And it was a, you know, a song that was what we considered our only weapon because we felt like it was nothing we could do. It was a no-win situation and we had to do something. So we did that record just as a protest record. It was a revenge fantasy record, you know, like uh, Quentin Tarantino did that movie, In Inglorious Bastards. Yeah, that was our Inglorious Bastards right there. You know, we did a, a, a song that, that really explained how we felt and all the youth that we encountered felt the same way. Not only the youth, but it's adults, it's like, in every country, people have a problem with, with the police and the authorities in their country abusing them. So it's just a song, it's an anthem, you know, to fight back against that kind of abuse. I do consider it nonviolent protest because we didn't get a Molotov cocktail. We didn't go on the streets, we didn't loot, we didn't burn shit up, we didn't do none of that. We just made music and we was creative with it and constructive with it, and not destructive, and, uh, and look where it got us. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, O'Shea, um, because you're like your father's twin, I'm going to jump to Corey. <laughs> I feel you, I feel and then And then we're going to come back to you. Clean? Right, right. Corey, um, yeah. you also had, uh, you know, unlike Jason, Jason didn't necessarily get to, the, obviously, rest in peace to Eazy-E, he gets to connect with Eazy-E, but you had Dr. Dre on set. Yeah. Um, yeah. And part of your task uh, was learning the mannerisms, the tone of voice, how he DJed, uh, you know, what he was going through, you know, how to look like he was, you know, learning how to DJ, learn how to produce. Talk about your process. Um, so originally, I was coming from, because I live here in New York, so I was on Broadway uh, working on Shakespeare. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, I rise, I rise. Um, so then 
uh, so it was kind of, it was, it was an interesting journey, you know, when it came across the desk, you know what I'm saying, like, to go in for Dr. Dre, and at first I, I didn't, I was, I didn't want to do it, because I was like, I don't want to mess up Dr. Dre's legacy, you know, um, but one thing led to another, I ended up Skyping with Gary, again, I get out to LA, studio test, you know, with these guys, um, and I booked it, and then I remember sitting down and meeting with Dre uh, for the first time, like we all went out to dinner and everything, and I look across the table, and you know, we, we weren't talking about the movie the whole time, like it was just about, about, you know, we was just watching playoffs, kicking it, and um, at the end of dinner, he pulled out his phone, and his iPhone, um, <laughs> of course, and, and, uh, and he, uh, was passing it around the table, and it was my audition, you know, on Dre's phone, and it kind of just laid it in, you know, just, just, just the magnitude of what I was about to step into.